and introduce. I'm very excited for um, Dr. Allen is here with us today. Um, Dr. Allen has been a professor of mathematics at Texas A&M University for more than two decades. He has served as associate head for operations, program director for the online master's of mathematics degree, and director of the Center for Technology Mediated Learning in the Department of Mathematics. His mathematical research has been in the areas of probability, functional analysis, numerical analysis, neutronics, and mathematical modeling. His education research is in technology and survey design and other subjects. Ellen has co-developed an online calculus course, an online text in linear algebra, and the history of mathematics. In addition, he has co-developed a fully online master's of science degree in mathematics, one of only a few nationally, and the only one specifically designed for teachers. For the master's program, he developed more than seven online courses. So we have, it's a great honor to have Dr. Allen here to share his expertise. And with that, I will pass the microphone over to um, Don. Okay, thank you, Tanya, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, I hope that I can uh, bring you some information or tips or uh, data that uh, that you can use back at your uh, home place and uh, let's just get on with it. Uh, the first thing I want to do is is classify bridging and what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. There's conceptual bridging. This was a, I would say, a major part of uh, the STEP program historically and that is uh, they would uh, NSF would fund uh, institutions to bring in usually non-STEM type people in, onto campus, uh, give them a one, two or three week program, pay them a stipend and uh, hope to stimulate their interest in, uh, in uh, science, technology, engineering or math. Uh, and then there are two other types of uh, bridging uh, that we're going to talk about today. The first is transitional bridging, and that'll be our main topic, and that's preparing students for the next venue, such as in a continuation course, or as in transferring from a community college to a four-year college. And these are often uh, overlooked, but as I hope to convince you, they're they're quite valuable uh, to uh, help students succeed. As I have said many times, and I'm sure you've heard before, it's easier and a lot cheaper to save the STEM student than to find a new one. And then the other uh, type of bridging is remedial bridging, and that's getting underprepared students ready for the collegiate level or uh, the level of some course where they aren't quite up to snuff on what they should know. So we'll be talking about uh, the second two uh, as we go along, but mostly just the transitional. And the first is going to be the transitional uh, bridging. Uh, the concept that we dreamed up one afternoon when we were in the doldrums over our uh, other type remedial bridging program uh, was to consider the students going from calculus one to calculus two. Now whatever I'm going to say here will apply to pre-calculus to calculus one or chemistry one to chemistry two or something like that and uh, often the students that come out of calculus one and let's focus just use that term uh, don't know or haven't learned well some of the concepts of the course particularly those that have a uh, lower grade in the course at our place um, students that get a D in Calculus 1 cannot go to Calculus 2, they must get a C. But the students that get a C in Calculus 1 have a huge dropout rate in Calculus 2. And this indicates to, to me, maybe to you and at least to our group, that either they're disillusioned with math or they didn't learn what they were supposed to learn. They were maybe having a transition problem themselves from high school to college and they didn't realize how much effort it would take. 
So this is the type of uh, program we call a mini bridging program, and we'll explain why as we go along. First, the, and th these are the components, uh, and substantially the components of this talk. Uh, we have to get our target group, and uh, then we have to find out how to recruit them, and then we have to uh, get them to sign up. This is not entirely easy uh, to do, but we had good luck doing it, and I think the reason is that after Calculus 1, where they came in to college thinking, oh, I'm going to get an A, I'm going to get all A's, because that's what I got in high school, uh, and they got a C, for example, we finally have their attention, and they realize that they're not where they thought they would be. Uh, the format of the uh, course was uh, one week, and I'll explain that in detail, and also it was online. So uh, this was uh, done the week before classes started in the second term, and uh, we thought, well, uh, some of them will be moving back to campus, some of them will be on campus, uh, and none of them very much like going to a classroom. They prefer to just lounge around in their pajamas uh, or whatever and uh, take the course online, and that seems to work very well. The third component was to get the right tutors, and uh, here I think we actually had some wisdom. Uh, and what we wanted were tutors that had both high school experience and collegiate experience, and were very engaging with students. Okay. Uh, now, a Calculus One student, a freshman in college, is still substantially a high school student in their head. The transition takes place after a couple of years, but it doesn't happen immediately, at least for those getting C's and B's. So we found very, very good tutors that are known for uh, engaging students and having a good uh, classroom discussions, and we paid them well. In fact, we paid them $25 an hour. The, the uh, fourth item here is, what are we going to do? We have only one week. We have to use it wisely. And by the way, why one week? Because uh, for many students, three weeks, which would be far better, is an eternity. And they won't stay with the program. One week, we can get them and keep them. And we did a pretty good job of it. Uh, the, the curriculum that we used was all the, uh, what you would call the soft spots in what they learn in Calculus 1, and I'll show you exactly what we covered. And the last uh, item uh, today will be to talk about the results. Okay, so let's get on with it. The targets were those receiving a grade of uh, C or B in Calculus 1. For recruiting, we sent an email to all such students explaining to them that they were at risk in Calculus 2. You can't be too hard on them on this, uh, but, it, but you do have their attention. Then we created a sign-up page, uh, an online sign-up page, and we had a huge turnout of those uh, signing up, over 150 students. Uh, and then we had so many students, uh, we didn't even have the staff, so we asked them to confirm that they did sign up and uh, that reduced the numbers. The challenges to bridging are convincing students that they actually need some help. We had a just-in-time program and during the first semester of Calculus 1, free, really great teacher, come in, get help, and you'll get it just in time for when you need it next week. But the students coming in as freshmen don't think they need any help. And that is what we thought was the reason we got very few attendees. The other uh, challenges are the students with borderline scores are very much at risk. Uh, even though we had 150 sign up, it was less than half of the qualified students chose to participate. But in, in uh, this game of bridging and uh, helping students, uh, getting even half of those eligible 
is a, is a very good thing. Uh, now, as to the first one, the, reme uh, the second topic, remedial bridging, um, this is a longer program. Uh, the first version, and, and we've been running this uh, uh, five years now. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, four of them, or three of them, it was dismal, uh, and we tried everything to get students to come. And part of the reason, uh, and I'll exp explain uh, last summer in a minute, uh, that we took six weeks to do it. And it was six hours a week. So uh, six weeks is a long time for a student, especially when they have to go to an online com uh, to a computer online and log in. Uh, they lose uh, they lose track. They convince themselves that they don't need it, or they convince themselves that they're not learning anything, and they convince themselves of anything so they don't have to do it. And then there are, uh, th there were four categories of algebra and precalculus topics. Uh, the usual stuff. Uh, the uh, the focus was mostly on uh, uh, problem solving, and over four years, over 500 students um, have enrolled in this program. And let me say, 200 of those were last summer. The fact is, we weren't doing well. We couldn't figure out how to get students to come. But for some reason, the message has finally got through, I think with the help of other departments, and we had over 200 enrollees in this summer program, which, by the way, we've cut to four weeks. I mean, three weeks. But we meet more hours per week. It's almost the same number of hours, but more hours per week. Six weeks is a long time for a student, especially a high school graduate. Now, this past... Uh, January and this coming January, we ran the mini bridging engineering to calculus two, which was 15 hours of online tutoring per week, and it focused on, as you can see right there on the screen, uh, derivative rules, integration, partial fractions, optimization. Those are the tricky spots for students that are just starting on calculus. And what we have shown is that the grades increased in calculus too for these students who spent uh, 820 minutes uh, engaged in this uh, adventure and that's uh, just what about uh, uh, 13 hours of the 15 but we're continuing our analysis of that hey hey Don I wonder if this is a good time for our first poll question oh yes let's have the first poll question and uh, uh, so you can go to uh, the polls there and uh, just take take the poll. It says, how important and is it's, bridging programs to be for improving STEM graduation rates? Yes, just check a box. Um, I know you're getting quite a lot of uh, positive feedback on it, but if you, if you think you can do the job in class, just say, eh, it's not important to me. And, uh, well, so far, a lot of you think it's important. Uh, it, a lot of it's sales and, and, and frustration that maybe you've built up over years of, of uh, trying to do your best teaching and uh, it hasn't worked that, that well. Uh, in any event, let me go on. Uh, I guess the poll is still open. And uh, I don't know if you can see the results on your screen, but it's split about equally between very important and important and nobody thought it was unimportant or very unimportant at all just a little bit in the neutral range okay here are some of the features of the bridge to engineering calculus it featured uh, well, for one thing the only eligible people well everybody's eligible but the only people we uh, rec tried to recruit were those that were less than a cut score on a math placement exam. That's what MPE means. And we have our own in-house exam. And we've been using it for years. But tens of thousands of students have taken it at this time. And we found only one error in it. But we fixed that years ago. Uh, 
It's 15 hours of live tutoring. Uh, it focuses on uh, trigonometry, parametric equations, and uh, 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 vectors. By the way, we do vectors in Calculus 1. Uh, there are calculus sequences without vectors. But often, high school teachers skip vectors in their pre-calculus class. So students come in having no idea what a vector is, and they get demolished in physics and things like that. It features live online tutoring, the ability of tutors and students to talk online uh, like we can do here. Uh, there's online breakout rooms. Uh, by the way, we use a net meeting for that. And we record the sessions for students to watch. And we give additional problem sets for students to do, plus our videos. The format's very interactive. This is in all our bridging programs, actually even our PPP program. But this is for the mini bridging program right now because I see 15 to 20 minutes. OK, so, so they meet three hours, say, in the morning or in the afternoon. And we also run an evening one if we have three. Uh, it, it meets three hours in the morning, Monday through Friday. Let's just say that. And that's divided into one-hour segments. OK, there's got to be a break in there. Students cannot stay engaged for three hours straight. I cannot stay engaged for hardly 30 minutes straight. Anyway, so there's 15 to 20 minutes of explaining with examples. By the way, that was learned by experience. We thought at first we'll just bring them in, give them some problems, ask some que let them ask the questions. They don't like that. They like a little presentation, gets them going. Then the instructor gives the class uh, 10 to 15 minutes to work out a similar problem, and often this is done in smaller groups in a breakout room. By the way, the whole group is in the uh, 20 to 25 range, and then they're broken into smaller groups. OK, students return to the online class. Everybody's in there together. And the instructor then does what she can to get them to elicit information and to talk. And this is why you need an excellent tutor. Not only one that knows how to explain how to do the problem in a way they can understand, but one who can engage the student to get them to talk about the problem. So a segment should take around 50 minutes. And then we give them a little break and reconvene for the second hour. Uh, with different materials. So in summary, uh, the, the meeting, uh, the, uh, it's online, fully online. It's mediated by web meeting. There's three hour sessions. Uh, this past summer, we didn't have an evening one. I mean, this, uh, we didn't have an, well, let me get into the summer later, because uh, we did the bridging in the summer too, uh, which I'll explain as a question later on. But it was the same idea. Students go in from Calc 1 to Calc 2, but they're off a semester. There was a live tutor. By the way, students tell us the live tutor is key. If we ran this totally online and passive, we wouldn't have kept them. It was the tutor that did it. Students are uh, given full instructions on how to log on, and nobody had any trouble. And all sessions were recorded, and we made it active on Facebook. All the students did chat. Here's the curriculum in the bridging to, this is to Calculus 2. And it's uh, written there uh, day one through day five. And as you can see, uh, uh, the key points that students have trouble with going into Calculus 2 are uh, derivative rules with, with all kinds of functions. Uh, Believe it or not, the quotient rule still troubles them. They don't know what to do with exponentials and logarithms. Often they, well, you know. You know what they do. And trig functions, well, my goodness sakes, they hardly know trig functions because it's not taught in high schools anymore, at least down this way. And so students come with six weeks of trig from their pre-calculus class and know very, very little. So we do quite a bit on uh, trig. Uh, the students, we asked how, what their weakest on, strongest on in trig, and they were, said they were strongest on solving right triangles and weakest on identities. But what is most important in calculus? It's trig identities, knowing them. Uh, solving right triangles is not going to help you integrate 
a lot of functions. Then we do the basic integrations, particularly with the substitution and using these transcendental functions. Partial fractions, you know, is difficult to teach. Students don't understand it, and they still don't understand it, but we cover it anyway because they're going to need it in calculus too. And then we do inverse trig functions and the calculus of those. And finally, we review some stuff at the end, uh, including limits, and then we talk about critical points and increasing and decreasing concavity and the like. Okay, so that's uh, the soft spots, as I call them. Our tutors are very experienced calculus teachers. None of them are from where I am, uh, so it's all online. One, uh, Abru down there, you can see her name, it lives in Turkey, in Istanbul. Uh, no professors. Uh, professors are not, well, we can't pay them what they get paid. Uh, some, I don't know if $25 an hour would tantalize them, but it is a competitive salary. Uh, and they were well versed in teaching online. And by the way, if you're going to run such a program, it's important to have an overall manager. Jill Nichols, I'd like to highlight as our overall manager, did an excellent job. She had really good organizational skills. She got everything going. Notes. Students were remarkably uh, weak on how to uh, solve trig problems, especially for integrals. And, uh, and they had trouble with identities and formulas. Also, it was sometimes difficult to get students to interact. So if, if you're ever going to run one of these online programs, finding people that can get students to interact is important because it keeps them coming back. If it's passive, they'll drift away. And uh, with this web meeting we use, students could talk to each other. They could talk to each other by their telephones. They could talk to each other on Facebook. And there was a lot of constant chatter going on. And we considered that very good. Uh, so in the results, where you wanted me to um, open up the second poll, Don? Oh yes. Okay. Fine. Sorry. Please. Uh, okay, we're up to poll two because the talk is almost through, and then we'll throw it open for questions. So, uh, if you're going to open up a, a bridging program, what to you are the most significant factors in uh, in doing this? And there's a uh, you can pick all the numbers you want. And I see the results are coming in, and funding is winning. Student recruitment is number two. OK. Uh, okay let's while you're answering away, uh, uh, you just continue answering. Uh, poll now, if you like. Pardon me? Oh, I'm just, I closed the poll and I'm showing the results now. Oh, okay. So you can see funding is important and there's good news here. The good news is that the mini bridging is cheap. Basically, you hire a tutor, an experienced tutor, so you don't have to, and you build a curriculum that they know very well. You pay them $25 an hour. And then uh, you hire them for 15 hours a week, one week. The cost of the tutor is less than $400. You have to give a little bit more to the manager. If the manager is also going to be a tutor, you have to give a premium there because the manager has a lot of, a lot of uh, things to do. And, and, and Tanya manages these webinars, and she fully understands <laughs> all the all that you have to do to to uh, to make that happen. Uh, so this is one thing you can go to your administrator and say, I'd like to run a bridging program from, uh, say, college algebra to pre-calculus. And we have uh, 100 students that are at risk. And I'd like to run this bridging program. It's going to cost you maybe $2,000 total. And even a dean would have trouble saying no to two grand. I mean, it's just merely a one trip to a meeting in New York. OK, so anyway, as you can see, the vast majority of our students uh, did stay the, 
the full day, the full five days, and put in 13 to 15 hours of uh, of work. So this means that this program that we just dreamed up one afternoon worked. I was so happy. Okay, the class was evenly split between uh, C students and B students from Calculus One. Uh, we were all. Uh, uh, originally targeting stu C students, but we opened it up also to B students, and we got uh, about half. Uh, it was about, uh, oh, by the way, in the first time we ran it, uh, I think it was 60 students fully completed the course. And uh, because they were there the last day and took the survey, and so that's how we counted. Uh, the uh, attenuation. Uh, ranged between tutors, that is how many the first day and, and the progress during the week, and it fell off uh, in the neighborhood of 20 percent. So uh, it's, a, it's a voluntary program. It, it was free, uh, and to get an attenuation on the week before classes start of only 20 percent we thought was wonderful. Uh, the students were overwhelmingly complimentary about their tutor. They overwhelmingly felt, and we have survey results for this, but I'm just summarizing it, uh, felt better for the next calculus course, and there was enhanced awareness of the need to study. My goodness, if we could get number four from every incoming student with an emphasis on the word enhanced, we'd all be uh, doing much better, or the students sure would. Uh, so that is the uh, another summary of the program. Uh, they had a meet the cut score, um, and then we had live online tutoring, ability of tutors and students to talk, online breakout rooms. Um, now, let me talk about that for a second. Um, we use something here called web meeting. Web meeting has a breakout room feature. This means you can assign, say you have 20 students, you can assign groups of four into five breakout rooms and give them something to do. And they can all talk to each other, but they can't hear what the other groups are doing. And the instructor can pop in and visit each room and listen to what's going on. So it's a very nice feature. But it's not essential. Even though, even though uh, uh, Jill, the uh, the uh, manager, said she thought it was important, it may not be important. And the reason I'm trying to waffle on this one is that if you order something like WebEx or or, or probably this one, go to Webinar, uh, and you add the feature of breakout rooms, the cost goes through the roof. Like for WebEx, for example, it was something like a hundred dollars a month or $80 a month. If we wanted it with breakout rooms, it was suddenly $400 a month. So breakout rooms apparently, and I, sh I don't think it's a programming problem, is a, is a uh, marketable feature. Okay, and we recorded, uh, we, we recorded the sessions, uh, and we made extra problems for practice, uh, which the students generally don't do, and we made videos. Now, it's a nice thing to make the videos, but um, and and when we started doing these videos years and years ago, we thought, oh, now students can come back and see the lecture, and catch up, but or or listen to it again. But students don't do that as much as you might think. You know, I can remember when I was a student. If I missed what the professor said, boy, it was gone forever. Now, uh, in the, with this new technology, it is. It's forever here, but students don't much take advantage of it. Uh, okay, and in a summary, uh, students overwhelmingly felt the bridge program helped them. It uh, refined their knowledge. It, it uh, hel helped them recall previous skills, and the recall is important because on things they've just learned, and then they have the long winter break, uh, or for the holidays, if you've just learned something that's already technical and you take a month off, 
a lot of it disappears in that month. So the recall is is a key point. And now our our grant that that all of this is done under has uh, advertised to the NSF that we want to be self-sustaining. It's a program like the mini bridging program which is inexpensive and very effective that can be self-sustaining because it is uh, uh, so inexpensive to run. And we so we thought well if we can charge the students twenty five dollars would we still get them to come? Now twenty five dollars for these students it's it's a dinner and a movie uh, so it's not much but they were equally split on whether they would pay a fee. So uh, it's uh, we may do it but uh, I think we can count on the small amount of money that it costs each uh, semester. Uh, from our department uh, or from the dean. Uh, we'll see on that. Okay, so uh, that's the program and what I will do now is open it for questions. Thank you. Yeah, I see one question. <laughs> so I don't know fun. what to do. <laughs> well, you can go ahead and type your questions into your control panel. You have a question box, or if you'd rather ask your question out loud, go ahead and raise your hand, and I will unmute you. So I already see someone's got their hand raised. Susan Lasser, I'm going to unmute you, and let's see if this works. I don't know if I have a speaker. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Um, I'm very intrigued by this program, John, because I, I have run a uh, summer bridge program taking students in, uh, on campus and uh, uh, putting them in either pre-calculus or Calc 1, and it had wonderful results, but we can't afford it anymore. Uh, so uh, my, quest, my question is, did you have any problem as far as students having access to the technology? But I work with um, minority students exclusively. Oh, the the question I believe is on access to technology, and the uh, there's a there's a long answer and a medium answer and a short answer, and let me give you a few answers. First of all, it's very helpful if your campus already uh, subscribes to one of these uh, online conferencing tools, such as GoToWebinar or WebEx or web meeting, there's web this and that. Centra is a very good one that I've used in the past. And if your uh, if your uh, if your um, uh, campus already has one and they may, uh, then you can use it. If you are a Blackboard campus and you have Blackboard Collaborate, you can do it on that as well. The only problem I can see is uh, that sometimes with Blackboard, only registered students are allowed to join in. So you have to make sure the permissions are, if you're going to run a summer bridging, uh, to get non-students to enroll. And uh, so that that's that. That's on the conferencing. On the other technology, you, you basically just need to make a web page that has the materials on it you want. And by the way, if you make videos yourself, you can post them on YouTube. What? You can create it. Yeah, you, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, if, is, can I do a follow-up question then? So you, you've never had any problem with the students not having computer capable computers capable of, of having this interaction. Uh, these are not uh, these are not technologies that are web intensive. If if the student has access to any technology where they can watch a YouTube video, they have enough bandwidth to uh, to uh, to engage in one of these programs. It's not as intensive. If they are on telephone modems, there's no way. They do need a machine and internet access, okay. and it's hard to find not high-speed or medium-speed internet access 
Now, right, right here in my office, I have a download speed of about uh, seven megabytes per second, and that's that's pretty slow, but it's all I need. Right. Okay. I'm just wondering because we have students in rural areas, and I just didn't know if that was a issue. Uh, I recommend that uh, that you poll those students to see if they watch YouTube. If they watch YouTube, they're they're good to go. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We have a couple questions um, that have been sent in. Um, the first one comes from Charles Knight, and I think you may have already answered this one. Do you provide them with video support, say from YouTube? Uh, Video support in the sense of uh, what to do if they can't, uh, if they are having trouble watching something, or uh, I'm not quite sure what video support means. Okay, maybe they only need a browser. Clarify that. He's probably typing it in right now. Let's go to the next question then, until we get some clarification on that. Um, from Anthony Giovanniti. What was the success rate in the class that was bridged for these students? Uh, we're still analyzing that, but we have noted in comparison with the control group. And what's the control group? The control group are those that don't take it. Is that for those that spent in the mini bridging program more than 80% of the time in the program, they did uh, experience an increase in grade. Now, a statistician could tear to pieces what I just said by saying you didn't have a properly designed control group uh, in the sense that we should have taken 100 students that really wanted to go into the program and said, okay, here are 50 of you. We're not going to let you in. And 50 of you, you can come in and then compare how those students do. So the bias in the study is that those that came in really wanted to be there and maybe for some reason had a greater motivation but the grades were increased I can't say by what grade point amount at this time was we're, we're still working on that okay does that does that uh, get part way through what you wanted to know I think it sounds good that it's a question that was typed in yep he said thank you <laughs> all right we had some clarification from Charles's question um, he wants to know if that you provided a set of videos that you have selected and loaded into Blackboard. Like for yes, we, we do have videos. We have videos, uh, and we make those available. Uh, we lo we don't we we use Blackboard, but uh, we didn't put them on Blackboard. We put them on uh, another uh, thing that we use. It's called WebAssign, where we set up the these uh, courses so that they could see the curriculum and everything and they already had accounts on WebAssign from the previous semester so that's where we put everything but it could equally be put on Blackboard it's the the trick of course is making the videos and uh, it would be easy to do a workshop right here at Step Central on how to make videos for people that don't know how to do it and and believe me the webinar would take at 30 minutes because it's so easy to make them. All you need is the tool, such as Camtasia, and a headset, and, and you're ready to, 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 to make videos. Um, in the early days, it was difficult, especially on the rendering, but now it's so easy. And you can use uh, um, YouTube, as I said. You can create a uh, your own channel on YouTube. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Charles Knight. Um, what online program did you use for the problems? Your own, A-L-E-K-S, or WebAssign? Uh, we used WebAssign, however, you could use uh, Alex. You can use any tool. You can put the problems, you can make a web page uh, right on your, uh, right at your home page, and give them the link, and uh, the problems are there. If you want the problems to be multiple choice and they get the correct answer and everything like that, then that's a little more serious and you do have to use a tool such as Blackboard or WebAssign or Alex. 
And then uh, if you're going to use Alex, that's mostly, as I understand it, in control of McGraw-Hill, and I'm not sure that they'd allow you to use it uh, for your own ends, not in a course uh, of their designation, but you can check with them. But Alex uh, is a good one. Another one is uh, the, the Pearson product. Uh, what's what's the Pearson product called? It's uh, My Math Lab. That's another one. And, and actually, you can use problems that are already there uh, if they allow you to shuffle them around. And so that those are a couple of ways to do it. OK, great. Thank you. Um, Nicholas Valentino asks, what kind of support do students who do not pass the math placement test receive, or students who receive a D in the first calculus series? OK, that's two questions. And I'll take the second one first, because it's easy. Uh, students that get a D in Calculus 1 have to take Calculus 1 again, and there's no support. However, at our campus, we have help sessions every week. We have live tutors, I mean live in the flesh tutors, that they go, go and see. However, often these people do not take advantage of services. They do take advantage of these off-campus uh, tutoring services that really advertise that we're going to get you ready for the grade. They don't teach that much. They prep you for an exam. And if the exam comes out in, in correlation to the prepping, the student might do well. But these students have all kinds of problems. One, they may not have worked very hard in the course. They may not be able to read very well. They may not be able to hear very well. Uh, and uh, uh, their math background may be poor. Now, uh, what do we do uh, for students that don't do well on the MPE, the math placement exam? Well, right now, as long as we have the money from the NSF grant, which we will lose at the end of next summer, is we have this summer bridging program, which lasts three or four weeks, and it's much more lengthy. And we have another type of program for pre-calculus that we're just starting, and uh, and I uh, it was a sort of spin-off from this. So okay, uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, Charles Knight asks. Um, I'm going to put these two questions together, um, whether or not you provide computers or calculators to the students. Uh, in our pre-calculus course and our calculus course, we do not permit calculators to be used. Okay, so there's no calculator support. However, for students on campus, uh, there are computing labs all over the place where students can can get uh, technology help. Uh, the only courses that we allow calculators in are business calculus and finite math. Those are the only two. We don't even allow them in the college algebra class. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons uh, why one would or why one wouldn't, and mostly it's what you believe works. But we, we can leave that for another day. Uh, but that's it. Uh, yeah, so there's computers available, and the university will also rent you a computer if you, if you want. Thank you. All right, so on to the next. We've got some great questions here, so thanks, everyone, for sending questions. Anant, Anant Kirkreti asks, have you tried using flipped lessons before the con before the before conducting the class online so that the students come prepared to do more problem solving? The question is, have we made things available to them before class so they can be more prepared? Right. To, yeah, so ask them to um, watch the, the lecture online first and then use the class time to do problem solving. Yes. That falls, that's a good question, and, and I'll tell you why, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to politic a little bit or so on. That is a sort of a variation on flipping the classroom. Uh, 
and getting them to do something ahead of time and uh, and then be prepared. Now, we had flipping the classroom back when I was a student, and that was a hundred years ago. S professors would tell the students, read chapter two, because I'm going to talk about it on Wednesday. But nobody would do it. And, and the flipping thing is very similar, but it's with videos. Watch the video. Mostly, the students, uh, it's available, by the way. We have videos available, problems they can solve. It's all available. They can take it at their own pace or what have you. But not too many take advantage of it, and, and that's, that's the crying shame. That will have to be a, a culture of students stemming from probably uh, grade school or high school. But now it, it's, uh, they don't do it. And that's why we have these very, very polished uh, people engaging them in the live sessions. Uh, because we can't count on them preparing anything. That's another reason why we wanted to get very good tutors. If students would read ahead of time before they came to class or they had a general habit of that, uh, we wouldn't have some of the problems we're having, I think. So there's my half political, half practical answer. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I just wanted to um, point out Charles Knight made some comments here. Um, there are very good videos available with, within YouTube, so you don't have to make your own. And then he also points out that it's easy to set up a course in Alex for less than $75, and my math test is available for only 10 So sharing some, some good tips there. Oh, thanks very much. I wrote that down. <laughs> my math test? My, it's called mymathtest.com? Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, my math test. Capital M Y okay. capital M A T H. Okay. There's also WebWorks, which is a big NSF-funded project, which is a complete online grading system with uh, thousands of homework problems, and it's all totally free. WebWorks.net or WebWorks.org. Very good, right. uh, and uh, since it's free, a lot of people don't want to use it. Okay, yeah, Charles is confirming that my math test is uh, Pearson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pearson has been a pioneer. They had a vision even uh, 15 years ago, and they pursued it, while a lot of the other publishers were uh, floundering, uh, trying this and trying that. Pearson has a solid program. And it makes money. What uh, if I can editorialize a little more? Uh, I talked to uh, the publisher at Pearson, and then and I said to him one day, I said, you know, the textbook has become a secondary resource. And he said, exactly. It's the online homework system that basically sells the books. Great. So we have a few more questions. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I got to. Um, Mary Fleming Hughes asks, how can I target transfer students from two-year colleges for a summer bridge program? How can I target them? Well, first of all, you have to target which two-year colleges you want to go to, and then get with your registrar and see who's applied to your campus and get access to the grades. Now, each one of those is a task. And then you have to decide on the basis of the grades who you're going to invite to the program. And of course, you're going to have to have a capacity of the program and who you will not invite. Now, when we started our, uh, our uh, first program, our summer, our big, long summer program, we did not target the worst students. We targeted the students we thought we could save. So they weren't the people at the bottom of the math placement exam. They were people that ju were just below the cutoff and not too far down from that. You have to make a decision on who you can save and who you can't save with the amount of dollars you have is, is uh, the best answer I can give to that question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one more question from Charles Knight, although I think you may have answered it this already is if whether they do homework. Do they do homework? 
Oh. Ah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And we had to make a compromise on, uh, on the mini bridging. We had to make the live sessions extremely high quality. So even if they did no homework, uh, they'd still get value from the program. But there was homework available to them. We gave problems for them to do, but we did not check that they did them. There's no grade associated with this, no certificate associated with it. It was strictly a voluntary program. And that we had so many attendees stick it out, we were very much gratified for. Okay. Well, um, I think that we've addressed all of the questions um, that have been typed up, and I don't see any more hands up. So I think we, um, unless there's any more last minute questions people want to send in, I think we're just about wrapping it up. So um, I really want to thank you, Don, for taking the time to sharing your about your program. It looks like a wonderful model, and I'd be like to see if anyone else out there would like to give it a try. Um, oh, and Susan Lasser actually has a question, and I think you're unmuted already, Susan, so go ahead. Um, sorry, I, I thought I was raising my hand. Um, Don, could you tell us a little bit about how you found these really engaging tutors? How did you recruit them? Could you, could you repeat, because uh, I'm having a little sound problem myself here. Okay. Could you say it again? Yes, I, I was asking how you recruited your tutors. I know you said you had really engaging tutors, and I wondered how you ah, recruited them. That is an art. I know. Because you, you really need a program manager, that's one thing, who knows the lay of the land. You need someone in your institution that was at one time a high school teacher and has maintained contacts or does other types of professional development. Uh, but for, for me, uh, say, if I was just a research professor and I wanted to go out and get great tutors, I wouldn't have a clue. So uh, that, is a, that, is a, that is certainly a very big thing is to find someone that can do the job and know where to find them uh, or how to find them. So the answer is <laughs> you, you either know or you know somebody that knows. And then just to follow up, did you provide training in online tutoring or did they already know that? We give the tutors a tutorial themselves mm -hmm. on how and then how to use the software. Okay. So we do, we do meet with them a couple of sessions to clue them in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, well, I think that wraps it up. It's uh, one minute before the hour, so we're wrapping it up just on time. Um, thank you so much, Don, for um, sharing your expertise and about your program. And also thanks to all of you who attended the webinar. Um, again, if it's, a recording will be available on StepCentral.net, so you can watch it again and again, or you can re um, share it with your colleagues. And, and, then, and I will be following up with all of you with links to, to um, access that when it's available. So with that... I will just say goodbye and thank you. I'll see you at the next webinar. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody.